Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Colin Von Liebtog, and I head up our alumni career engagement program at Rutgers. Welcome to the program today, Make Retirement Work. In the United States, on average, we spend about 34 hours a week working, give or take. If you spend about 40 years of your life working, that ends up being almost about 60,000 hours. And over that time, we often use work to express ourselves, our sense of purpose, find our identity, especially in the United States, where often our job and our sense of identity tend to become very closely connected with each other. But when we stop working, how can we ensure that the experience ends up being a satisfying one when so much of our purpose and our identity is really tied to work? Well, our guests today, Rick Heron and Andy Gogates, will help us answer this question as we discuss the non-financial aspects of retirement planning and living. Rick and Andy are the authors of Make Retirement Work and also the website by the same name, makeretirementwork.net. I've had the pleasure of knowing Rick and Andy for a number of years now, uh, both uh, before they retired and, and since they've retired. And I got to tell you, they really are the salt of the earth. Um, they currently, like I said, are retired, which is where I hope to be one day uh, before long. Um, so uh, they lend a very great uh, perspective to this, this entire concept that we'll discuss today. Uh, just as a reminder, please feel free to submit questions, comments throughout the program. We'll take them as they come in and, and as we can, uh, but we'll also have some time at the end for Q&A uh, as well. Well, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Rick and Andy to introduce themselves a little bit more. And also, if they could, as part of that intro, just share something that has surprised them so far about being retired. Andy, I'll turn it over to you. All right, great. Thanks, uh, Colin. Uh, great to be here. Uh, really appreciate it. Always great to connect with, uh, with Rutgers. Um, I have a background in uh, executive recruiting. Uh, that's where I started my career in Wall Street. I worked for a couple of different firms. Um, U.S. Trust, Goldman Sachs, Bankers Trust. I got into the after that, got into the executive search business. Uh, I did that for about twenty some years, and uh, had my own business for years. Dealt specifically in the um, uh, the uh, alternative uh, investment space. Um, and then at the latter part of my career, I wanted to do something different and joined Rutgers in their MBA program, uh, working in career management. I mean, it was right up my alley. It works with students. Uh, helping them prepare themselves to get jobs and working with companies to introduce them uh, to uh, to the Rutgers, to, to these type of students we have. So um, uh, that was great. Um, and then I decided to retire. During that process, when you think about what am I going to do, how am I going to do it, I came across this guy, uh, Rick Heron. Uh, Rick is also came from career management on the undergraduate side in New Brunswick. I was in Newark. And um, we met on a couple of occasions. One of them was in Florida at one of a, conf a conference. Uh, we met in, in New Brunswick. And um, over a beer, uh, we started talking about retirement. What is this all about? Why We're, we're new at it. How do we do it? Um, and the conversation just kept on going. Um, and we ended up uh, saying, you know, we're going through this process. A lot of people at our age, which are baby boomers, as we're both baby boomers, uh, there's a lot of us. And as we talked to everyone, they said, you know, we're going through the same issues. So we said, you know, maybe we should try to give people our experiences. We come from an industry when what we did for a living was in the transition business. We move people from job to job, uh, which is what I did. Rick did it from you know, coming from the university into job. So moving from work the work environment to retirement is a transition. And we are pretty good at it. We've been doing it for years. So we thought, well, maybe this there's something to this. Um, you did ask a, a question um, about uh, what, what, what was the biggest thing that I found when I retired. And I, I, I want to say that, you know, being busy is very good. You know, um, sitting around complacent, uh, you may want to say, gee, what, a couple of my friends say, gee, I can't wait to retire. I'll play golf. And I said, yeah, well, that's great for many months of the year. But are you playing seven days a week? <laughs> Won't that get old after a while? And then what are you going to do in the winter if it's too cold? I mean, I guess you can go to Florida and continue to play seven days a week. I said, but I'm not sure that's fulfillment. That's what you're going to be enjoying. I play golf once a week. That's great. And I enjoy it. Maybe twice. 
but then I'm done. I have other things that I'm interested in. And so that would probably be the biggest uh, transition I had is that I did have a tremendous amount of time, but be, found that being busy is better than not being busy. Rick, turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Andy. And thanks, Colin. It's wonderful to be with everybody uh, this afternoon. Um, just by way of my background, as Andy indicated, um, uh, I've, I've worked uh, predominantly in the career development space at universities for my entire career. Actually, uh, I counted up the years the other day, 42 years altogether uh, at uh, four different universities, most recently uh, uh, at Rutgers and before that, the University of Maryland. Uh, before that, uh, Miami of Ohio, down near Cincinnati, and before that, a little school up in northwestern Ohio called Ohio Northern uh, University. Uh, but as Andy also indicated, much of what we've done, the essence of what we've done over our careers is to help people make successful transitions to the next phases of their life. Uh, and uh, for me, it was tremendously rewarding uh, to be able to, to work with, with the truly the best minds in our country, if you think of it, uh, and, uh, and uh, to have wonderful colleagues for that entire span of time. But interestingly enough, uh, in responding to the question about uh, um, one of the things that, that uh, I discovered um, after I retired is that um, I don't really miss work. Um, uh, I, I enjoy the freedom to be able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Uh, that is, as long as my wife is, is in sync with me on that. And if not, we do what she wants to do. Uh, and that makes life just a little bit easier. But um, 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 the, the sense of freedom that, that uh, retirement bestows is really a kind of a unique feeling, I think, for, for all of us. Yeah. And, you know, you, you both touch on this point that um, some of what you did, you know, in work, you you still carry forward in, in retirement a little bit. And I think that really, uh, you know, discusses um, some ideas around, you know, one of the, the points within your book, Make Retirement Work, uh, around the three L's. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about what are the three L's and how do they really factor into retirement? As we uh, kind of did some investigation, obviously, when we started this uh, process, we read as much as we could. We got involved in as many things as we could to try to understand what this retirement was for us personally, as well as, uh, you know, trying to impart this knowledge uh, out to everyone else. Um, and what we discovered is um, there are really three elements. We call it the three L's uh, that everyone should try to do when they retired, and I really probably all throughout their life, but retirement especially, uh, one is you should have some leisure. You're entitled to leisure and whatever that leisure may be. Um, you should have some learning. Every day, try to learn something. Don't give up on learning, you know, whether it be a newspaper, whether it be a language, whether it be a musical instrument, um, that helps the brain keep on going. Um, and it's also, uh, I think, very important for engagement with, with, other, with other people. And the other is labor. I mean, do something. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to work it's for money. Um, it can be. But, you know, there are things that uh, people can do. I mean, if it's working in a garden. I mean, what, what happens is when you look at those three L's, they all get integrated. Um, you know, and I'll give you a perfect example. One of the things that I've gotten involved in and I'm very passionate about is the Kalmar Nickel. Kalmar Nickel is Delaware's tall ship. It's a four-masted replica of a boat that sailed from Kalmar, Sweden, and ended up in Delaware, and it's very much part of the history. That was in 1638. So it's a replica, and I trained, and I am now a crew member on the Kalmar Nickel. Uh, many of the people that are on the crew are retired, like myself. Um, but what happens is you, you, you work on the boat, you do painting, you do scraping, you clean bathrooms, you swab the deck, you steer the boat, you pull lines. Um, and if you, th if I think about it, and it, we write a blog uh, every month on our website, and one of the blogs is about Kalmar Nickel. And as I analyze it, the, that is covers all three. 
Um, I, I, it's leisure to me because it's a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, it's labor because you're physically doing things um, and you're learning. I mean, there are 180 different lines, ropes that are on this boat that you need to know what they do and when they do it, commands. You're constantly learning, I mean, learning about what, how people lived back then, um, how they made it from Kalmar, Sweden in three months across the Atlantic and ended up there. I mean, it just, it, you, you become a part of it and it becomes uh, uh, really exciting. I mean, I, I, don't, don't get me started. I, we'll, we'll kill a whole hour or so by me uh, speaking about the Kalmar, but uh, I'll, I'll bring up uh, uh, of that, of that later on. But everyone every day should try to think of those three L's, um, labor, leisure, and learning. Yeah, there's really a, a, an important sense of balance, it sounds like, you know, ha has to come with our activities um, so that we are making meaningful use of our time, uh, fulfilling, you know, and, and satisfaction with what we do. And this really, I think, ties in with one of the questions we had from the audience come in during the registration process. Um, you know, they were wondering what other factors are associated with satisfaction in retirement. Uh, and they specifically were asking about engagement, this idea of connecting with a larger community, with close friends, family, and, and how does that impact our sense of retirement? And how can we connect that with this idea of the three L's? Yeah, and engagement is, is actually the one critical element of, of a successful retirement uh, based on the research that, that, that we have done. It's very easy. Uh, when one first retires to become isolated and, and unengaged, if for no other reason, then the routine of, of retirement is much different than the routine that we follow uh, during, our, during our working lives. And so, um, uh, as Andy and I have researched this more and more and more, th this, there's a recurring theme about, uh, about engagement and about the importance of relationships with not only people that you already know, but the idea of reaching out to, to others uh, in whatever your new circumstances might be as a retiree uh, to, to form those, those relationships. And so uh, we, we stress that in, in, in the book. And interestingly enough, um, there was a, a book published uh, by some Harvard uh, professors recently, actually in January, uh, called The Good Life. And, and that book um, uh, chronicles a longitudinal study that was begun in 19, or, yeah, 1938 uh, that, that uh, wanted to get at what makes for a, a good life. And what the authors have found and what they reiterate in all 300 and some pages of the book is the importance of relationships. And that's, that's as true in retirement, if not more true in retirement, than any other stage of, of life. So um, that, that's an important takeaway for, for us. And I might mention, too, uh, before we continue here, you know, a a Andy and I are more fellow travelers in this whole process than researchers per se. Uh, but because this has become an area of focus for us, we kind of key in on, on things that relate to this theme of, of a happy and fulfilling retirement. So uh, we're happy to be joined by other fellow travelers today, at least virtually, as, as we continue this process of, of discovering what makes for a happy and fulfilling retirement. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, we learn best sometimes from our experiences, right, uh, rather than just uh, sitting in a classroom or, or through observation. So that, that concept of fellow travelers, I think, will really resonate with people quite a bit. Um, you know, and, and also this idea of relationships. Uh, Andy, I see how that could really tie in with being a sailor, you know, because you're sure. part of the team on that boat. And, you know, it really touches on the learning and the leisure and the labor and, and this idea of connectivity. And, and, you know, sense of common purpose, um, you know, you, you know, speaking about this idea of, of relationships, we had a great uh, question come in uh, just now from the audience. Um, so this uh, individual says that they're 58, uh, retired four years ago from a demanding career. 
uh, currently work several part-time and volunteer positions, most of which are taking place in the evenings and on the weekends. Um, their wife, who's also the same age of 58, still works, but largely full-time. Um, any recommendations uh, or what can you suggest for ways that they can find time for them to be together in some meaningful way without that being contentious, given the, the disparity between one partner being retired and the other not? Um, relationships, yes, uh, are, are very key. Uh, I recall uh, someone saying that uh, when the one spouse retired, one had stayed home most of the career, raised the kids, the other one worked full time. And um, uh, the, this was happened to be the wife. That said, the wife said to him, um, listen, it's great you retired, but I married you for better, for worse, but not for lunch. Uh, you have to get out there and, and do something. I mean, I would say they need to find a common ground as best they can, and it could be in volunteerism. I mean, some sort of volunteer activity that they can do on the weekend together. And he's talking about part-time jobs, uh, depending on how much they need the money. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's, that's that critical. Find a volunteer opportunity that they're both passionate about to work together on, uh, I think would be a, an ideal way to start and a precursor to when she retires, whenever that might be. Um, you know, that I think seems to make sense. Uh, anything to add on that, Rick? Well, the only thing I can think of is it sounds to me like, like they might be on the right path already, uh, because they recognize the importance of nurturing that relationship, mm -hmm. uh, ra rather than kind of going their own separate ways based on the new rhythm in their lives respectively. So, uh, I agree with you, Andy, uh, uh, you know, a, as we know, volunteerism really opens up so many new opportunities in so many different kinds of ways. And if they can agree to volunteer for the same types of causes or the same types of activities, um, that could be a, a real, real key. Yeah, it really helps to bridge the gap, you know, that, that's there between one retired partner and one, you know, who's, who's still working full time. Uh, I think that's a great idea to, to find the volunteer connection, you know, so you're doing something meaningful together, you both care about. Um, but at the same time, it bridges that that transitional piece a little bit, uh, and really connects with sense of purpose, which is what we're talking about here with the three L's. Um, I will mention that uh, Kalmar Nickel, many couples, husband and wives, uh, volunteer. It's, you know, one of those things that you see quite, quite often. So just through no, another plug. And nobody's gotten thrown off a boat yet, right? Uh, no, they've fallen okay. off, but nobody's gotten thrown off. <laughs> okay, as long as it wasn't intentional. Then no, it was not okay. intentional. Okay. And it was, at it was at the dock, so that's good. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, in addition to uh, the three L's helping us find a sense of purpose, um, I know you've also explored some uh, concepts in Eastern cultures, uh, particularly from Okinawa, Japan. And... Um, you know, this is a, a region of the world where some individuals may typically have a longer lifespan uh, than those in Western cultures. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and, and also this concept of Ikigai? Okay, sure. Um, when we started this project, uh, some of the research we came across uh, was uh, an article that was written in Harvard Business Review, um, and it was uh, by, by Neil Pashrika, and he was wrote the article about a uh, study that was done in Okinawa, Japan. Okinawa, Japan is one of a few blue areas of the world where people live longer than anyone else. They call them blue, blue sections of the world, blue, blue zones. Um, and so when they did the analysis as to why, I mean, first of all, when I first thought about it, I thought, okay, well, first it would be, uh, they probably eat more fish. Uh, rice, their, their diet is much better. Uh, I don't know what kind of work pressures they have. That would probably be less so. Um, and they, when they did the study, yes, there were some of those factors that came into play. But for the most part, it was they, they, they don't have a word for retirement. Retirement is, is a, uh, a Western phenomenon. It's not a Eastern phenomenon. And they use a term, it's called ikigai, I-K-I, GAI, and in Japanese, loosely translated, it's a reason to get up in the morning. That is what they look at their entire life. And so if you move from your work environment to your retirement, where you're not working every day, 
you still have something to do and a purpose to get up and do something every day, whatever it may be. It could be a part-time job. It could be caring for, for grandchildren. It could be driving people around to get to doctor's appointments that can't drive. It can be volunteers. It can be anything. Um, but it is something that you need to have a reason to get up. It's very easy, even in volunteering, that you, you know, you, your back is a little sore. I mean, I know mine is. I always have a little hitch in my getty up when I first get up in the morning. And, you know, but if you know you have to be somewhere, you make an effort. If you don't, you roll over and you go to sleep and you sleep till noon. I mean, and that's not good. But that's what the Japanese and the Eastern cultures seem to, it's, it's throughout their philosophy during their, their whole lives. They're always thinking of what do I do every day, which I think is fabulous. And that's a sort of, it's a theme throughout our book. And really when you look at it and what people strive for when they retire is just that. Uh, they may not call it Ikigai, but it is just that. Another distinguishing factor of, of the, the Eastern culture, particularly as it relates to Okinawa, is that there's a much more intergenerational uh, interaction uh, within that culture than there tends to be, at least at, at present, uh, in Western, Western cultures, or at least the American culture. There's more separation, it seems to me, uh, between the, the generations in our country than there is certainly in Okinawa, Japan. But as Andy said, uh, you know, while the term ikigai might be foreign to us, the translation is really easy. And, and, and as Andy indicated, it's a reason for getting up in the morning. Uh, you think about it and it, it's, it's pretty profound despite its simplicity, I think. And, and so we go into uh, quite a bit of depth about Ikigai in, in, in the book for those who want to investigate that a little further. Really interesting point about the uh, generations, because I think we're, we're now at a point where there's uh, potentially up to five generations in the workforce. Uh, you know, first time in history, as far as we know, that that's really occurred. Um, you know, and, and there are opportunities there, I think, for, for learning and growth and, you know, uh, you know, developing new skills, if you will. Um, and some might find that to be an intimidating kind of situation and want to accelerate the idea of retirement a little bit. So yeah, it, it's a great point you bring up because there, there is opportunity there. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, something that, that is daunting. Um, and it, it may be a different kind of a perspective we need to take uh, uh, in, in that situation. Um, you know, and, and as we think about this transition, right, from, from career to retirement, uh, and let's take finances out of the equation for the moment, um, you know, assume everything is, is where it needs to be. When do you know it's the right time to retire? And, and how do you make that transition, especially if you've had a very active, successful, you know, busy kind of a career? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I I think Colin and and you know we we have to acknowledge the the importance of financial stability as part of a successful retirement, although that that's not the area of, of our focus in in the book or in, in our presentations. Um, uh, and the other thing I think uh, is helpful to to uh, acknowledge is the the point of absolute certainty about when to retire can be pretty elusive. And, and that's just the natural, that's just the natural way of, of, of the world. But what we have found is that those who take the time to plan uh, their retirement, particularly their entrance into retirement, usually have a much smoother launch uh, uh, into that phase of their life. Uh, as, as a result, and, and much more so than those who wind up entering it either voluntarily or involuntarily, kind of cold turkey. So uh, plan, planning is very, very important, and, and it's difficult to do, especially when so much about retirement is in the realm of the unknown. Uh, and, and one thing we found, too, is based on relationships that people have with their peers or colleagues or, or others who are in similar circumstances, that group planning seems to help a lot. You know, you bounce ideas off one another, 
Uh, Andy and I did that our, ourselves as, as we were getting ready to retire. He relocated from New Jersey. Um, I, I stayed in New, New Jersey, although moved to a moved down the shore as it, as it were. And we compared notes and, and the, and the advice and guidance I got from, from Andy helped me to make a more successful transition. So we, we, if, if we're willing to learn from each other and teach each other, uh, that makes that transition a little bit bit easier, and you enter the the new phase of your life with greater confidence. If I can uh, uh, add to that, dovetail onto that is that um, some people do a trial period. Um, if you can do it with work, if you can take a longer period of time or take long weekends, but act as if you're retired. Don't uh, you know go on a vacation, but act as if you're current, retired. I mean, you can go on a trip, but the, you would be doing that during work work time. You really want to do it where you're really thinking about, okay, so we have four days and we're home. What are we going to do? And and think about it and, you know, try different things. Um, I would, you know, if you're going to be staying where you are, start to build those relationships. One of the great place to do it is the local coffee shop. I did that when I first moved to, to here in Milton, Delaware. Uh, there's a local coffee shop and got to meet a bunch of men that have were all retired. We had similar interests, uh, some not so much similar interests, but we all love to get together and, as we say, solve the world's problems um, every day. Um, if you are relocating, the one thing that I felt very helpful was to get to know the community. And you can do that by visiting staying and hanging out, going to the local uh, restaurants, et cetera, uh, social gatherings. Uh, but you also, um, I found it helpful to subscribe to the local newspapers, uh, the news feeds about that, that, that area. I, I looked at the uh, plan for the town, the 10 year plan, the master plan, try to see where is it going? What, where, what's happening? That's really what you want to know is, What's the, how is the local politics? How, how is it function? How do things, how are they governed? Um, if you're interested in nonprofits, how many nonprofits are there? I mean, do a little prep time before you jump in feet first. You're still gonna have bumps in the road. I mean, it always happens, but you really want to be able to um, get as much information as you can prior to making those, those changes. Excellent advice on how to prepare and plan, um, tapping into local resources, social connections, um, you know, and, and really being able to prepare as best we can. And you mentioned those bumps on the road, too, which, you know, they're a part of life, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They'll be a part of retirement just as they were, you know, pre-retirement. It wouldn't be fun if it wasn't that way, you know? Yeah, right. That <laughs> keeps it interesting. Um, you know, and, and with, you know, time will come change and unexpected developments. Things may go differently than we hope or we plan. Um, and it really connects with uh, a question that had actually just come in during the chat. Uh, this one's from Paul. Um, how do you address physical limitations that occur after retirement, especially when those circumstances change your planned retirement activities? Um, you know, in this case, something physical like playing golf or hiking, but then you have a condition that affects your mobility. Um, could we speak to that a little bit? Yeah, th those type those types of changes, uh, un unfortunately, are are inevitable in many cases as 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 we as we uh, age. And I think uh, w one way to kind of prepare for that, if one can prepare for those those types of eventualities, uh, is to have as broad a range of interests as as possible. Uh, uh, for, for, for me, I, I enjoy golfing more than once once a week. Um, um, I don't do it seven days a, a week, uh, but uh, I, I, I sometimes wonder whether or not that might not be a pretty good pastime uh, if, if, if I could do, do that. So the idea of, of going back to the three L's, especially the learning L, uh, I think comes into play here because... Uh, retirement offers, you know, the, the time in many cases to learn a whole lot of diff different things. Uh, one of the things I'm doing, um, I was telling Andy about this the other day, I'm learning how to play the piano. Uh, so far, I haven't gotten past Jingle Bells, 
uh, with the with the with the chord pattern on on that, and I've been working on it for three months. But the <laughs> idea is, uh, I'm I'm working on it. You know, it, it's something other than the, it's not physically taxing; it's mentally taxing as a devil. But uh, I I figure by next Christmas I'll have jingle bells down down pat. So uh, the idea here is is to is to have a breadth of interests uh, and activities. Um, and to and to stay as active as, as one one can be, and the other thing too that comes to mind, uh, uh, not to beat this right into the ground, but it's very very true. It's essential. Relationships relationships are the key to happiness, despite whatever situation you might find yourself in. I think increasingly throughout life, but certainly. Uh, during the retirement year. So that that's my thought. What what do you think, Andy? Oh, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think the other thing I was thinking as you were talking about it is that, you know, golf, um, sailing, I sail sailboats normally, um, but there, you know, if there's a physical limitation and it can, can work out, um, many of them have, have been able to figure out still how to play golf. There are these golf carts uh, that have people that you can stand up that drives right to the ball and it, you stand up right next to it and it holds you up if you can't physically stand up to still be able to play golf. I mean, it's not the exact same, but it's pretty close. I mean, you've seen people, you know, ski on three skis, you know, sit down skis, um, sailboats. They have a, um, a seat that swings from one side of the boat to the other. If they're their lower part of their body, that can't work. So it doesn't work. So, you know, do investigate the other alternatives that are out there, even if you do have those physical uh, limitations. But what Rick said, it, it's the diversity of the types of things you're involved in. Uh, and so if one drops out for whatever reason, um, the other uh, can can definitely, uh, definitely pick it up. Well, that's certainly a lesson that you, you both taught me during our times uh, in, in career services is that, you know, um, you can find a way. You know, you might have an area of interest and, and uh, say I love sports. I'm, I'm probably not going to be a professional athlete at this point in my life, but it doesn't mean that I can't work in athletics in some capacity and be around the energy of it, the mm -hmm. things I enjoy about it, and some of those other aspects. Um, yeah, excellent, uh, excellent points there. Um, we've, we've got some activity here in the chat, so I, I want to um, uh, address uh, Laura's question. Uh, Laura, uh, congratulations. Laura just retired one month ago. Very good. Um, at the age of 65. Uh, so you have another fellow traveler there in the boat with you guys. Um, how would Laura go about finding volunteer opportunities? Uh, Laura's interested in volunteer interaction specifically with children. And she went to her county's website on volunteering and they really only listed about four activities. So what are some additional resources people can look at for retirement uh, and, and volunteer opportunities? Well, fortunately, uh, there is a very long list. Uh, if you go online, uh, you know, it was great that you went to the local uh, area to find it. The states have it. Um, AARP is a great, great resource. Uh, they have a ton of different things. Uh, in our book, in the back, we have a resource, uh, a bunch of resources, and we have over 50 different types of resources, many of them and most of them are on the volunteer side. Part of it is I've always been a proponent of volunteering. I volunteered when during my work life with boys and girls clubs. Uh, most, uh, as I did research on them, most nonprofits are in dire need of expertise, whatever that expertise is. Uh, you fortunately can get paid very little or nothing and provide that expertise, and you're fortunate that you're able to do that and they desperately need that. But you have to find the ideal slot that makes, makes sense. So yes, uh, continue to investigate that. Um, talk to people, just have conversations. You know, you're in the food store, you see someone, have a conversation. Um, you uh, are out and you see a bunch of kids together and there's somebody managing them. Are they a school group? Is it an after school program or what is it? you may learn something. And the first volunteer opportunity you get may not be a match. Don't give up. Continue to look for those other types of things. I have found that many nonprofits 
are really not good at dealing with volunteers. They don't quite know what to do with them. You have an expertise, so you sometimes have to kind of will your way through, like you do in an organization on the corporate side. You join with job A, and then you find it's not ideal. Let me try to figure out where else I would be more productive and be more beneficial to the organization. It works the exact same way. It's not that much different. So what she's doing is perfect. But there's, um, what's the group, uh, Rick, you, you, I think, know more about it. Volu is it uh, volunteer.com? No, what is it? It's called uh, volunteermatch.org. Yes. And, and, and it's broken down into geographical uh, types of, of references that Laura might find helpful. And it, uh, I'm also thinking, you touched on this uh, briefly, Andy, about, uh, about the local schools. You know, that's where the children are, so perhaps that's where opportunity exists. Churches also come to mind, uh, uh, dealing with, with families, as most uh, churches and synagogues do. Uh, another comes to mind, uh, there are children, the children's protective services in each county and, and mm -hmm. throughout the United States. Sure. Uh, there's a friend of the court uh, uh, opportunities. And so, um, you know, part of the fun here for, for Laura could be just the investigational process to see where all she can dig up this kind of information uh, add. And as you indicated, Andy, you know, you, you don't want to be discouraged by by the, 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 the first gig that might not be exactly what you were hoping for, because minimally that that would lead to other types of connections that might be more beneficial. So those are just some random thoughts that came to my mind. No, very good. Very good points. Some of the, uh, the opportunities, whether volunteer or otherwise, in, in terms of engaging others, forming social connections, relationships, um, you know, staving off feelings of social isolation, um, they may involve us to take that step, right? To, to, to initiate the conversation, to visit the coffee shop, uh, to join the community group. Any tips for introverts? Who, who might have a little bit more of a challenging time doing that. They want to get out there. They want the social connections. They realize the importance of it, but it's just kind of hard to take that first step. Uh, that is true uh, with the job that uh, Rick and I both had for students uh, coming out of, uh, of universities. Um, you know, getting to get, you need to be out there to be able to see what the opportunities are. Um, I would say, uh, Step one was, you know, try it, you know, just suck it up and try it once or twice. And there are certain times, you know, when I would go to a, a large group organization, you know, stand in the back. I mean, kind of view what's going on. You don't just have to jump right in. The other thought I have is don't forget about the Internet. The Internet is not the same as a one face to face, not quite the same. So try it on that and sort of be your test get involved in something volunteer wise or, uh, you know, teaching kids or whatever it might be, but you can do it online. It's probably less intimidating online than it would be on a, on a face to face basis. Any thoughts, Rick? Yeah. The, the other thing that, that uh, we sometimes uh, talk about and, and there, believe me, there are lots of introverts. In fact, uh, um, uh, I am one, uh, classically, uh, for, for that matter, for self-disclosure. But uh, <laughs> what what is sometimes helpful is is to is to uh, find a buddy uh, who is engaged in whatever it is that that you might be interested in, and kind of pal up with them. And if they they go to a, a meeting or an activity, and you know they're willing to to take you along. Then that kind of eases the eases the stress of your becoming engaged uh, in something that might have a, a major benefit to you as you go through the retirement years. So um, um, beyond that, though, some, sometimes, as Andy said, the best thing to do is, you know, just hold your breath and jump into the water and and believe that you won't sink; you'll swim. Um, uh, and that is a much better alternative than not being engaged, mm -hmm. not following your, your interests. Um, but it, it, it's, we realize it's easier said than done. 
but even as we say that, we also say do it. I mean, the one thing you have to remember is that when you're going to these organizations, you're going to these groups, the people you're interacting with are as interested to learn about you as you are with them. They're not there to judge you. They're not doing any. They're really trying to engage you in what they're interested in or they're passionate about, whatever it might be. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind that it's not a judgmental thing. It's really they're trying to engage you as much as you want to engage with them. Somebody once coined the phrase dare to fail. Mm -hmm. And and if you can dare to fail, you know, the the world's your oyster. Uh, So... um, so I would certainly encourage that. But again, I acknowledge it's it's easier to talk about than actually do, but do it. And, and believe it or not, sometimes, you know, when meeting someone, especially, you know, early on or for the first time, uh, an extrovert can be an introvert's best friend uh, because all you got to <laughs> do is ask the right question. Exactly. And they'll handle the conversation for you. You know, exactly. you just got to tap into your listening skills. Um, so, yeah, good, good advice all around. Um, and, and a nice piece of advice here, too, from Marion in our chat, uh, one of our audience members. Marion had said how uh, she started volunteering actually in her 50s to kind of test out that assumption of, oh, if you have more time, you know. And, and then that, connecting back to a couple of the points that you both made, gave her a chance to try out different organizations to see what's really a good fit. And then she went into it with a, a smoother transition, it sounds like. Um, speaking of uh, smooth transitions and... Um, uh, you know, some potential challenges that come up. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about navigating retirement in the age of COVID? Uh, you know, we're, we're still in pandemic. We're, we're not quite out the woods. We, we are out the woods. Some people are more comfortable than others. Um, how do we, how can we navigate effectively? Um, I would embrace the computer. Uh, that is an excellent idea. We're doing it now. Businesses do it now. Colin, you're doing it now. Mm-hmm. We're all doing it. But embrace it as a communication tool. It will keep you connected. I know a number of people who have lost track of um, their um, friends in college or high school, and they've reached out when they were sitting at home doing nothing through the computer and developed a relationship again. Um, some of it romantic and some of it not, but just a connection again, which would just make, it makes tons of sense. You can do long distance learning computer. I mean, besides universities, uh, there's a number of places that you can learn whatever you want to learn via the computer. It usually not a, a major, a major cost. I know one is LinkedIn learning. Uh, LinkedIn learning is interesting. You can actually apply to be a, a, a professor on LinkedIn learning and people can sign up for your course, whatever it might be to, to learn about something, whether it be from model trains to uh, World War II to whatever it might be. And uh, again, that that would, uh, one way I would say it, you're limited physicality, you can't be next to people, but the computer is something, if you're not computer literate, you need to go be, get the minimal amount and learn more by going online to learn more about the computer. Uh, another resource that I just recently um, uh, discovered is called Brilliant.org, and it's an online learning tool. Um, some more self-disclosure here. Uh, when, when I was in, in high school, I struggled mightily with algebra, uh, and, and uh, so much so that when I joined the, the Army in, in the early 70s, they wouldn't let me anywhere near close to an artillery piece because uh, when you're shooting cannons, you, you got to be able to do math sometimes on, on the fly. <laughs> and they didn't have great confidence that I'd be able to do that very well. Uh, so I, I wound up in the infantry, but uh, n- none, nonetheless, uh, this brilliant.org uh, is helping me to learn algebra. And, and it's, it's pretty cool, as a matter of fact, because there's nobody standing over me. Uh, I, can, I can answer the same question wrong three or four times until I get it, get it right. It's great feedback. And so this idea of, of using a computer as a learning device is really very, very good. Foreign language is another one. Uh, 
I'm using a com computer a little bit for my piano lessons. And so there's, there's a lot to learn. But I think the overarching thought that I have on this is, even in this age of COVID, relationships still matter. Isolation is still dangerous. And so uh, make, make sure that you stay as involved as you can with as many as you can, however you can. Yeah. One of the things my uh, wife and I do every day is uh, we use Alexa to ask question of the day. Uh, and they give you random questions uh, and they have four answers and you have to answer it. You don't get any money for it, but you get points. And I think we're up to 4,000 points that we've accumulated over the last three or four years. Um, so it's just another tool to keep the brain sharp. And then we continue to have a discussion about it later in the day about what the answer was, which we didn't understand, or we may do a little more research. Uh, but that's just something that we found uh, very, very helpful. Yeah, uh, learning at your leisure uh, doesn't have to feel like labor, right? So, exactly. so there, that's a different spin on the oh, three. Oh, very good twist, Colin, good. Yeah. Learning at your leisure so it doesn't feel like labor. Right. So that, that's what I'm, I'm getting from this though, because the learning aspect can be very fun. I mean, if you had told me, you know, go back and learn algebra again. I, I would have flashbacks to my teacher standing <laughs> over me at the chalkboard yep. or something. But but the way Rick put it on Brilliant, it, it sounds good. You know, um, that's something that really trains your brain and gets you thinking in a logical and analytical kind of way and, and uh, you know, keeps those neurotransmitters firing, you know. So um, the idea of social isolation uh, seems to be a, a bit of a common fear as we're noticing in the chat here that, you um, uh, uh, a few people have mentioned that it's a concern for them. So I'm glad you're able to give us some of these tips and really emphasize the idea of uh, social and relationships and how important they are. Um, it, switching gears a little bit here. So uh, we may all retire at different ages, different stages of, of life. Um, have you noticed any difference or, or have any thoughts around those who are retiring a little bit earlier in life versus those who are maybe retiring a little bit later? Yeah, you know that that kind of reminds me of of a conversation I had with a with a colleague at at Stanford who who uh, I met online as a matter of fact as we were writing our our, our book and he said uh, uh, to me shortly after the the book was published he said uh, Rick you know there's actually three phases to retirement and he said there's the go go years there's the slow go years. And there's the no-go years. And, and I've kind of taken that to heart. And one of the things that I found since I moved to this 55 and over community down the shore here in New, New Jersey is, is the younger retirees uh, have the great benefit of a longer expanse of go-go years. And it seems to me they're always traveling somewhere. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're going on what they call vacations and I keep asking them, how can you be on vacation when you're retired? You know, you're, you know, you're retired, you're on vacation. <clears throat> and so they go off to all corners of, of the earth and they bring back all these pictures and they have us come over to their patio and we look at the pictures and we hear about their adventures and how they had to take Dramamine so they didn't get seasick on the ship and, and all those, those types, types of things. So younger retirees in particular uh, if they have the means, have the good fortune of being able to travel and, and really work on their resp respective bucket lists. And, and the rest of us uh, are otherwise engaged, hopefully in satisfying activities that might be a little bit closer to home. Uh, but, but the idea is we stay active, we stay involved, we stay interested, we learn, we, we recreate uh and we don't work any more than we have to so um um th that that's kind of what what my thinking is on 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 this one and by the way i don't i don't begrudge the travelers uh i sometimes begrudge having a look at all the pictures they bring back but otherwise it's all good well one of the other points i'll make about that is that if you do retire early it could be a perfect opportunity uh, to do something, I mean, you can have another job, but it may not be what you did before. And that may be one of the reasons you retired early. So this is an opportunity to go back to school potentially, or go into a field totally foreign to what you, something you really wanted to do and never did it. So Colin, 
I think maybe third baseman for the Yankees is out when you mm -hmm. retire early, but you could be a sportscaster at a local small, I don't know. You know what it might be. Yeah. It, so you, you I, I think it is a good opportunity to be able to do other things to either make some additional income, but could be something that's, you know, really something you really enjoy doing. Or you could yeah. learn how to play the piano. There you go. Not make a living at it though, Rick. <laughs> Just work for tips, you know? <laughs> work for tips. He may be starving. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great advice though, because some may be considering, you know, returning to work in some capacity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is there a way to kind of combine those interests, the experience you might have and, you know, to, to Rick's point about doing it more in that go-go phase probably than the, the slow go or no go. Yeah. Uh, I really like that. Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, actually, oh, we got an audience question here from Eric. Um, what are your thoughts on the statement, it is very difficult to retire in New Jersey? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I am in Delaware. Uh, so uh, you do have to, uh, and I, I did it for a number of reasons. One, one is that uh, I, I am a sailor and I do want to be near the water. Uh, it's very hard to get from northern New Jersey to the ocean. Uh, without spending three days or four days on the Garden State Parkway. Uh, so um, uh, that was one reason. I'm 20 minutes from, from the ocean, and that's perfectly fine with me. Um, and the answer is you have to look at your own situation. New Jersey is difficult, uh, highly taxed. Uh, here in Delaware, we are one of the low-taxed states in the country, no sales tax. Every time I go to a state that charges sales tax, if I go to dinner, I get pissed off. Because I don't do that. If it, if the meal is six ninety five, I pay six ninety five. I don't pay six ninety five plus another two dollars in taxes. So um, it's um, you just have to look at each situation. Um, I, I really can't answer that. New Jersey has a lot to offer. It is crowded though, um, and, but the expense is what most people most people mention. Yeah, and what what I would suggest in in light light of that is is um, you know take the take advantage of the availability of good financial planners to 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 help mm -hmm. you uh, kind of fi figure out how best to retire in New Jersey if one wishes to stay in in New Jersey. There there may be uh, various financial adaptations that can be made that that will will ease that, but. That's an interesting question, especially given the fact that Aunt Andy was out of here with the quickness uh, after he retired. And in fact, he, he started to transition well before he retired to get down to Delaware. So uh, but everybody can't go to Delaware because if they do, it's just going to be another New Jersey. So well, know, there's a, there's, unfortunately, there's a lot of people down here uh, that are that are my uh, my age. Rick was talking about financial planning. And we, we, it's not really part of our, our, our discussion at all. But, you know, if you do do that, I mean, you, you, a lot of resources. AARP is terrific. Uh, there's the Financial Planning Association, uh, which it gives you a lot of information on what a financial planner does, the different requirements, what they can say and what they can't say. Um, your personal banker at the bank is helpful. Uh, Kiplinger Personal Finance is great. Um, one thing I will mention, though, and we hear a lot about it, is just be care careful of scams. You know, the, the people at these they get older are very prone to scams. We read about it all the time, these Ponzi schemes, and people lose everything. Uh, Bernie Madoff. I mean, it's just it's amazing. Uh, even at high levels of, of society, people have given away most of their wealth and have lost it all. So just be very aware of it, and if you question something, speak to one of those financial people and they will let you know uh, that, you know, 50% return guaranteed every month is probably not going to happen. So uh, just be aware of that. Yeah, it sounds like a very nuanced experience, right? And a, and a lot to plan and consider, whether it's taxes and financial planning, whether it's the weather and, you know, what that can afford you in terms of opportunities or uh, social connections, you know, mm -hmm. and being closer to family, further away from family, friends, that kind of stuff. Um, so a very multifaceted kind of experience and uh, kind of connects with a comment from Karen, actually, in our chat. And uh, Karen's actually a faculty member at Rutgers and, and enjoys working a great deal and doesn't really have an extra exit strategy right now. 
Um, and it's kind of surprised at how many people can't wait to retire, you know, thinking that there has to be a financial reason to keep working. And maybe you're just enjoying what you do, you know. And, and so that's that's another aspect to kind of consider with some of this. Um, we're running close to time, actually, here. So I have one more question for both of you. And then certainly if there's anything else we can get to that's coming through the chat, we're happy to do so. Um, what is the one thing that you wish you knew uh, or did? before you retired that would have made the post-retirement life even better? I think uh, in, in, in my, my case, um, and I say this not just tongue in cheek, but, but actually it goes, goes back to that whole, that whole notion of, of the freedom that, that, um, that retirement offers. Um, uh, I, I really think as much as I loved my work, particularly at Rutgers, um, um, ha had I, had I known the, the uh, amount of, of freedom that, that, that retirement provides, I would have retired earlier. I, I would have taken advantage of, of, of those maybe two or three years to, to do things that, that, uh, appealed to me rather than than live in a more constrained world of you know eat sleep and work um uh every, every day so i i i wish i i would have known then how good it was now um i i would say I, I would agree i think you always have questions is it the right time should i go i think i was ready for it i had a lot of thoughts ideas i didn't know exactly what it was um but I'll, I'll give you a, one of one, and I'll br bring back to the the Kalmar nickel is that uh, this past summer um, we take this 140 foot wooden boat on cruises, not with people, but just for us to get to another location. And we went left um, Wilmington, Delaware, in July. It took three days, uh, 24 hours a day, three days to go to Norfolk, Virginia. And we went along the coast. Um, everyone has jobs. We change on different watches We sleep a little and work a lot and sleep a little and work a lot. Um, and um, everyone has jobs on those watches. And one of the, one of the jobs is to steer the boat. And I was at the helm uh, and it was a absolutely gorgeous night. We had some not heavy seas, but we had 68 foot waves, which is for a big boat. It causes some splashing and bouncing up and down. Um, and I'm at the helm and it's gorgeous. There's every star in the sky, about 30 miles off the coast. It is absolutely wonderful. And I'm steering this boat and I'm thinking, holy mackerel, this is the most interesting experience I ever had and will have. And not many people have that opportunity. I couldn't have done that if I had been working because I would not have had the opportunity to spend the time to get training, to know the boat, to have the, to be picked, to be able to be on a cruise. I mean, th those are the kinds of things that you don't know what you're missing until you, you know, you, you have to try it. Yeah. And I did it. And I'm telling you, um, it was spectacular. Um, so just, a, I think that it's comfortable to, to stay where you are. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's perfectly fine. But just, you know, as Rick said, you, you have all these opportunities out there. You want to be able to take advantage of them. It sounds like it's really about planning for another aspect of life. You know, throughout mm -hmm. life, throughout our careers, we encounter challenges. We come up with plans. We implement plans. We adapt. We adjust. And we live. And, and this is another aspect of that. It's a monumental aspect, you know, in many regards. Uh, but one that we can develop a plan for and, and one that we can execute. We're going to have to have you guys back. This was wonderful. Uh, we're going to have to have you back for another uh, episode, so to speak, or a workshop, something where we can work on developing that plan together, you know, and, and really help people with that aspect of it. I, I think that it'd be so beneficial uh, for, for audience members and participants. Um, in the meantime, though, before we have Rick and Andy back again, uh, we certainly uh, can direct you towards their book, Make Retirement Work. Uh, got a copy of it right here. Uh, great book, um, great website to make retirementwork.net. Um, and, and if there are certain topics you'd like to see in part two with Rick and Andy, we'll be sending around a post event survey uh, tomorrow. Please feel free to leave suggestions, comments, thoughts there as well. 
uh, we'll be happy to take that into consideration as we plan the next steps. Also want to say a special thank you to Caitlin, uh, our events team, uh, to uh, for, for the great job in organizing this and putting it on. For Danita, thanks for putting those great posts and, and summaries and resources and everything in the chat. We appreciate that. Uh, and certainly to Rick and Andy, thank you so much for, um, you know, all you've done for the university, uh, you know, but but also what you're doing for us now in, in terms of giving back and lending your wisdom, your expertise, uh, you know, and, and certainly your kindness, too. So thank you to you. Thank you to our audience, our alumni. And we will see you next time. Great. Being, glad to be back. Thank you, Colin. You got it. It was fun, guys. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.